Uh, good afternoon and welcome to our Simon Alumni Lecture with Professor Ron Schmidt. My name is Sean Bogdan. I'm a 2008 full-time MBA graduate and join you virtually today from Plano, Texas. As a proud member of the Simon Alumni Board, I'm pleased to be hosting the session today. We are thrilled to offer you this talk. It's my pleasure to introduce Ron Schmidt, the Janice and Joseph Willett Professor for Teaching and Service. Ron has won numerous superior teaching awards. He was instrumental in the development of Simon's European Executive Programs and created the school's uh, coach program. Uh, two kind of personal things I would say is, when I think of Ron, two things occur. One, I get sweaty palms because I think back to class and I think back to whether or not he was gonna call on me and if it was gonna be one question or four. And then the second one would be obviously the project that we all used to do in his class. For me, it was Gap and American Eagle. And even to this day, I still find myself uh, reading articles about both companies. So we hope you've done your homework for today's talk. We please utilize the Q&A box. Questions will be addressed at the close of Ron's remarks. Ron, mic is yours. Thank you, Sean. Uh, this is a significant day in history. 405 years ago today, William Shakespeare died. And uh, we'll pay some homage to him in the lecture. A happier note, 100 years ago today, uh, in Buffalo, New York, uh, Warren Spahn was born. Now, some of you were too young to know who Warren Spahn was. He's a Hall of Fame left-handed pitcher, started with the Boston Braves, followed them when uh, they went to Milwaukee. And uh, we're going to talk about him, not only because he's an interesting baseball player, uh, but because in uh, 1964, Warren Spahn was the highest paid pitcher in baseball. And I thought uh, after I explained to you something about the research I've done, we'd talk a little bit about um, the changes in pay for CEOs and compare that to baseball players. And I'll explain to you why I think uh, that uh, comparison is not definitive, but helpful. Uh, I got interested in looking at the relationship between CEO and pay and shareholder return uh, based on uh, the way it's treated in the popular press. And I'm going to give you an example of that treatment. Uh, this comes from the Wall Street Journal uh, in 2019, and it says, for the fourth straight year, the biggest US companies set CEO pay records in 2018. A Wall Street Journal analysis found even as a majority delivered negative stock market returns to their shareholders, a sign of the often weak relationship between pay and performance, median compensation rose to 12.4 million for the bosses of S&P 500 companies last year, up 6.6% from 2017, and the highest since the 2008 recession, the journal analysis found. Yet the median shareholder return for the company was minus 5.8%, the worst showing since the financial crisis. I'm gonna talk to you about whether that quote is representative, I'm going to argue that it is not. I'm going to explain why it is not. And then I'm going to explain to you how I measured CEO pay differently and found a very different result than what's reported in that quote. There's another quote that is, uh, that motivated me. And this was from a book by Thomas Piketty. I don't know if you heard about this book. Uh, it's uh, five or six years old. Piketty wrote an academic paper with Emmanuel Saez on income inequality. And then he wrote a book on it. And he went on and on and on. And uh, in this book, Piketty attributes the increase in income inequality that has been observed in the United States uh, to uh, CEO pay. And he has a quote here. He says, top managers by and large have the power to set their own remuneration in some cases without limit and in many cases without any clear relation to their productivity, which in any case is very difficult to estimate in a large organization. Now, I'm not a Shakespearean scholar. 
and I do read a little Shakespeare, but much enjoy live theater on Shakespeare much more. But there is a quote that's appropriate to that, and it comes from Henry the Fourth, Part One, and it's from a scene where Prince Hal is quaffing ale and wine with Sir John Falstaff, and Falstaff is uh, talking about being robbed. In fact, the robbery was staged by Prince Al, who wasn't being very princely, either with his quaffing or with staging this, but he was playing a prank on Falstaff. And Falstaff is going on and on about the robbery. First, there are two thieves, and in a short period of time, it's 11. And Prince Hal stops him and says something that uh, I would say to uh, Piketty. And that is, these lies are like the father that begets them gross as a mountain, open, palpable. And I'm going to show you that at the end and explain to you why it is absolutely arithmetically impossible that CEOP pay can be the reason uh, economic inequality has increased. Okay, first, why uh, are, is the Wall Street Journal mistaken? They're not mistaken when they look at annual pay. If you look at annual pay, you'll find very little association. And if you look at the supplemental tables that I have provided you, uh, the first table that comes from the paper I wrote will tell you exactly what the problem is. And in this uh, table, there, this chart, there are three lines. One shows the average pay of CEOs who in a given year don't exercise options. That's about half of them. The other shows you the top line, the highest line, the orange line, shows you the average pay of CEOs who do exercise options. Note there's a big difference between the orange and the blue line. And then there's the black line, which, re which re reveals the amount CEOs who exercise options get from options alone. And if you look at that, you'd say, well, for the group that exercises options, what they get from options alone is larger than the pay for those who don't. Now think about this. We try to determine whether the pay for these people is related to shareholder return. And the first return in the first place, what would we say? We'd say, well, look, the option exercise doesn't depend just on return for a given year. It depends on a return since the options were granted. Uh, and, and that means when we look at these people, what we're going to see is half the sample with pay that's very large given returns and half the sample with pay that's very small given returns, that it, it's just a futile exercise to search for a relationship between pay and shareholder return by looking at annual data. And you say, okay, Ron, fine, I agree. What should I do? What you should do is what I did, and I started this late summer 2019, not realizing how much time it would take. And I decided to measure compensation for the CEO and returns for the CEO over their full period of service. I wondered why someone hadn't done this. And about uh, two months into this, it was clear to me why someone hadn't done this because it's a very tedious process. And I have built a, a sample of 521 CEOs. For each one of them, I measure how much they're paid over their full period of service and what the return was. Now, these CEOs start in 1992 or later, because that's the first year that in which data is available in the CompuState Executive Comp database. And they finish in 2019 or earlier because I don't look at any CEO that's still serving. These are all uh, full terms. And one of the things that makes it tedious, notice I have to get the data 
And, and the compensation I measure from executive comp is C, total CEO pay with options valued at their exercise, what they realize by exercise. And um, I have to adjust those for inflation because I have data from 1992 through 2019, and I have to do that for each CEO. All right, I get all that data, and then I have to measure the returns, and that's problematic as well because uh, the start and the end date of the CEO is what I use to measure the returns. I know this all probably boring you because it's dull, and it, it, it was when I was staring at my computer as well. The fact is, it takes a lot of time to do something other than look at annual pay and, and to create pay for the full period of service for the CEO and a matching shareholder return for that period. And on top of that, I calculate a matching return to the value-weighted index, which is a marketing return, which is a market return for the same period of service for the CEO. Okay, so what does it look like? What does it look like? Um, and 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 is is the pay measure this options plus uh, exer uh, total pay with options valued in exercise? And the answer is no. There's a little I have to add on. Uh, the previous chart I showed you was uh, that measure: total pay plus options valued at exercise value. I add in to the full service pay, the value of in the money options, the CEO holds in his or her last year. So that's what's in uh, the second chart in the notes. And you can see, obviously it goes up because the longer you serve, the more you get paid. Uh, and you'll notice if you look carefully, and the next chart will help us to look even more carefully, that this amount that I add in that typically gets ignored, that is the value of in the money options in the last year's service. And most CEOs have these. Uh, and, and it gets ignored. And I'm going to show you that this is a significant part of pay that's being ignored. You can see that better in the second graph I have where I simply take these measures and I uh, uh, translate them into average annual amounts for each category of tenure. I have CEOs in the sample from three to 19 years. And you can see uh, that when you, you, that the options in exercisable in the money options are important. Uh, I, the total amount of exercise of in the money options, the total amount consists of both those that can be exercised, which is 90%, and those that can't be exercised. Okay, now maybe you're interested in what the sample looks like. All right, here uh, I have a chart that shows you uh, that about half the sample serves eight years or uh, uh, less than eight years. I think there are 261 below and 260 above, and I have a total of 521. So that's the median pay. I show you a little bit about retirement age when the terms end. They're clustered around 65, which is interesting. You know, and, and, and uh, the first piece of evidence that flies in the face of Piketty here, uh, companies are allowed to have mandatory retirement rules for high paid individuals. CEOs certainly fall in that category. And you can see that the uh, age at end of term clusters around 65. A lot of companies do this. The next chart, which shows the value-weighted and the shareholder return for each tenure category. Now remember, I've got executives differing uh, uh, tenures. And for each, I calculate the average shareholder, each, each, each category of service. I calculate the uh, shareholder return 
and the valuated return to notice that uh, you don't get to be beyond five years, typically, unless you deliver shareholder returns that exceed the market. For the first three categories, three, four, and five, uh, you'll note that uh, for two of them, there's uh, the, the valuated return exceeds uh, the shareholder return. And uh, that's not true for any uh, from five years, from four, six years on, uh, which says first to Piketty, uh, look, these guys aren't setting their own pay. Boards are paying attention to what goes on. And if the CEO is delivering a disappointing returns early on, um, he or she has a good chance of being gone. All right, now I want you to look at the evidence and I want to talk only about part of it, which I think is the most important. And that's because I have a, only an hour to talk and, and other parts of it would require uh, much more detailed uh, explanation than you are interested in hearing now. But I have this rather big table. I've run, run three regressions. Uh, the most interesting one is uh, I could run as a feature of my sample. Uh, now, you, you, to be in my sample or my collection, you have to be uh, on the list. Your company has to be on the list of the Fortune, excuse me, S&P 500 firms in 2018. So I'm only looking at large firms. All right, that, those are the highest paid CEOs. You have to be on that list and I have 520, as I told you, but a number of them are CEOs who serve for the same company. I have some cases where I have four CEOs who serve for the same company, some with three, some with two. And that's important because it allows me to use a statistical technique that uh, avoids the consequences of unobserved variables. And the way I do that is instead of looking at pay and relating it to show shareholder return, I look at difference in pay between two consecutively serving CEOs and the difference in their shareholder returns. Now, what this does, as opposed to when you look cross-sectionally, part of the variation in pay is traceable to having boards that make different kinds of decisions about pay. Uh, when I look at the differences, and this is the regression on the right, which I would argue is the most significant of them, uh, I find that I can account for roughly speaking, uh, almost two thirds of the variation in CEO pay with a set of variables that include shareholder return and the uh, return to the valuated index. And I'm gonna tell you that those two returns are extremely important. It's not an accident it shows up. I'm also going to suggest to you that I found something that absolutely stunned me when I looked at it. I, it it's a hypothesis. Now, if you think about this, okay? If you're sitting on a board and you pay a CEO an option, and the market goes up, but the company's return goes up the same or less, what would you say? You'd be less happy than if the CEO beats the market. Now, what does that say? That says, well, when you run a regression and you put in one variable shareholder return, that variable should be positive and significant, which I find. But on the other hand, I would say, I should have found that without any question whatsoever. And the reason I should have is because most CEOs are paid in options. If they're paid in options and I'm measuring pay based on the realized value of the options, the CEOs whose shareholder returns have gone up more uh, should be getting paid more than the ones where the opposite was true. I find that. But the second thing you should find is that the value weighted index, 
should be negatively related to pay, measured over the full period of service for the CEO. I find that. Finally, and this is uh, the most important part, it says that this description that Piketty puts forward of chaos and in setting of CEO pays just doesn't fit uh, because it turns out that the coefficient on the shareholder return variable is positive. On the valuated variable, it's negative, but most importantly, the two have about the same absolute value. And that means that if the shareholder return matches the market return, the net impact on pay is zero. That says boards over the CEO's period of service are looking at how the CEO has done with respect to options, but they're also looking at what's happened to the market. And they'll pay more to somebody if I award a second group, reward options more than once to a CEO who's consistently beating the market and not do that to one who isn't. That was, I, I, that's the hypothesis I advanced. And quite frankly, I'm not certain I would find it. And I was stunned when I saw that. I ran a regression fairly early on in the process when I only had two observa 200 observations and found some, this interesting result. And that's what pushed me to get through the rest of the data and get a total of 521. And um, I mean, I don't know how long I'm gonna keep teaching and doing this, but as you can tell, I get a little bit excited about this. I'm gonna expand that uh, sample in the future. All right, so what does the table tell us? The table tells us that the Wall Street Journal is dead wrong. There is not a weak relationship. There's a pronounced relationship between, share, between shareholder return and pay. More importantly, we would tell them, uh, we don't have to, you don't have to believe in some kind of statistical hocus pocus. It's virtually certain there will be because CEOs are paid with options. And if you're paid in options, you're gonna find pays correlated with shareholder return. That's a logical consequence of the way they pay. Finally, it shows that what we have here is uh, boards, paying attention to what's going on in the market uh, when they pay CEOs, which is exactly what we want them to do. And in short, the pay setting process is an organized one. Now, I wanna be careful here. I'm not waving my hands and say, see, CEOs are paid appropriately. Nothing in my paper says CEO, there aren't overpaid CEOs. I'm, I'm going to give you some examples of some. It's kind of a stunning example because uh, they're all in a family of companies. Uh, uh, Sumner Redstone gets paid $21.2 million a year for delivering returns that are four and a half percentage points less than the market uh, for CBS. Now, the Redstone family owns a good bit of CBS and Viacom. After that, Les Moonves gets paid 87 million. That was 87 million per year for 13 years. And his returns are larger than the market by 0.17. In other words, he got $87 million a year for delivering returns that CBS shareholders could have gotten from a, a market index. And then we have Viacom with Philip Dahman, who gets $58 million a year, and he's below the market. Those make the front page of the newspaper, probably not the CBS Evening News. They make the front page of the newspaper. What I want to suggest to you is they exist, there are problems, but most of the CEO, for, for the majority of CEOs, that's not the case. I'm going to take you through um, uh, some examples here. Uh, Varian Medical Systems. 
as a medical device producer, uh, has uh, had uh, the CEO, Richard Levy, had returns, shareholder annual returns of 45% over a period where the market return was 3.5%. In other words, he beat the market by about 42 percentage points. He got paid $26 million a year. He said, well, that's a lot less than Moonves. I'm trying to tell you, Moonves is the exception and Varian and others uh, are the rule. Okay, I have another part of this I'll come back to if I have time, but I wanna go through some other things. Um, I have a table that shows you how many exercise options. Uh, there are uh, only 27 individuals out of my 521. That's about 5% who didn't exercise options while they were, C while they were CEOs and left office without in the money options. So, Ron, you didn't say anything about the size of the coefficient. It's about 3%. That is the shareholder return coefficient. A one percentage point increase in shareholder return boosts total pay over the CEO's period of service by about 3%. If you move your company from the 25th to the 50th percentile, that's a change of about six percentage points. Uh, and that's above the market. Your pay, total pay will go up by 17%. And if you go from the 50th to the 75th, it'll go up by about 20%. So there's a pretty hefty pay increase associated with delivering shareholder returns. It's not a tiny fraction. You know, we can argue about whether that's enough or not enough. Uh, the problem I have whenever I start thinking about that is that I'm not certain I understand fully how do you, how you, make, how you motivate someone whose wealth is measured in hundreds of billions of dollars. Uh, all I know is that uh, the methods of pay are producing uh, some correlation between pay and shareholder return. Now, you look at the table, you saw T statistics. And I've taught statistics and I'm convinced that a large number of students left my classroom. Uh, uh, knowing what a T statistic is, but having very little intuitive feel for it. And I will confess to you openly, I have very little intuitive feel for it. Is there some way, Ron, you could show people the, the nature of this association between shareholder return and CEO pay with a graph? And this is figure five in the paper. Uh, it's I'm on page eight of my handout here. And um, uh, what I do here is, and, and this is the problem. You sometimes see these charts, uh, not like the one I'm going to show you, but ones that plot shareholder return and pay, and it's a big blob. It looks like there's no pattern whatsoever. Well, if you'll notice in the table, I have more than one variable to explain. And what I do in this, uh, the, the top chart here is uh, I conduct a little test. So when I do the difference regression, I'm really measuring a ratio of the pay of two consecutively serving CEOs. And I do a little thought experiment. And I say, okay, what would that ratio be if the difference in their shareholder returns were zero? Okay. And I estimate what that ratio is look at the actual ratio, and I compare those two ratios. Those two ratios ought to be very different when the shareholder return is high. The difference in shareholder return is high. And they ought to be very different when the difference in shareholder return is low. This is what the T-statistic is measuring 
but you still like to see a picture? Well, I show you the picture there. And you look at those dots in, in uh, what's called figure five in the paper, and they're not a big blob. They show a very visible association between shareholder return and pay. This comes from the difference regression. And uh, you, so you don't, if you're talking to someone you don't have to say what the T-statistics was because they'll think something is uh, horrible has happened to you. You can look at this chart and it shows you that we can account for a good part of the variation with shareholder return. All right, let's get back to my, uh, our buddy Spahn. His pay in uh, uh, 1964 was 85,000. You adjust that for inflation, it's about 700,000. And I thought it might be interesting to look at what has happened to the pay of major league baseball players and compare that to what has happened to the pay of CEOs. Now, the reason I do this is that um, CEOs are not a random draw from the population. They're talented individuals and, and uh, we should ask ourselves, well, what's happened to the pay of talented individuals like baseball players when we look at CEOs? I'm saying it's not definitive, but it's helpful. You say, but Ron, why don't you compare it to the average pay of a worker in these companies? Because I have no reason, none, to justify the claim that both should go up at the same rate. I can't make any statement about that until I know something about what's happened to the CEO's job, it's gotten more complicated. And what's happened to the job of the average worker? Uh, I, I don't mind if people pre present that evidence. I'm just cautious about what I draw for. Underlying that is this notion that equality is a natural state. I take issue with that. It's not. There's all sorts of evidence that looks at individuals and birth order and outcomes. That is, are outcomes different if you can, in some ways, hold genetic endowments the same? And the answer is they are quite substantial. More lawyers in Boston are first born. Uh, more merit scholars are disproportionately first born. People at Stanford looked at, uh, looked at this a different way. They compared uh, individuals with IQs of 140 or higher or less than 140, and they found out all sorts of variation within that. I, I, I would like the average worker to earn more, but we have a market and companies are hiring from that market and they're hiring CEOs from a market. And I don't have an argument that says both ought to move at the same rate. That is an argument as an economist. I have an argument as a human being that says it would be nice if they moved at the same rate, but I don't have a justification as an economist. So let's look at, let's look at baseball players. And, and we ought to be clear that there's been some changes in baseball. I'm gonna talk about Bob Feller in a minute in 1946. Uh, there were no black players, black baseball players at that time. That's changed. And clearly, uh, in the late 70s, in the in, in 80s, uh, the reserve clause went away. The reserve clause essentially made a baseball player a slave to the team that signed him. Uh, he couldn't leave and sign with another team. Well, that's changed. We now have competition. So part of what I'm showing here is um, uh, I'm going to... Part of what I'm showing is the result of those changes. So here's what I have for you. I have what's happened to the minimum salary in baseball since 1967. It has gone from $6,000 in 1967, which is about 45,000 in 2018 dollars or 2020 dollars. And it's gone to, from 6,000 to now the minimum salary in baseball is $570,000. That puts 
every major league baseball player in the top 1% of the income distribution. Uh, that wouldn't have been the case in 1964, but a number might have been. The, the minimum salary goes up by a factor of 12. The average salary over that period goes up by a factor of 32. Inequality has increased in society. It has also increased amongst baseball players. Do you have any more evidence on that? Uh, yeah, let's look at Spahn, who got paid 85,000, which was, we said was 700,000 in 1964, and Garrett Cole, who is not the highest paid pitcher. Um, he gets 36 million. The highest paid pitcher was just signed this year. That's Trevor Bauer, who signed a three-year deal for 38 million. Max Scherzer for the Nationals, uh, who are now my adopted team because I have abandoned all hope for the Cleveland Indians. Max Scherzer gets 35 million a year. Well, it says that pay for the highest paid pitcher in baseball, if we use Spahn, who was the highest in 1964, has gone up by a factor of 50. Now there's another highly paid pitcher from 1946, I told you about, Bob Feller. I mean, he has astonishing statistics. In 1946, Feller had 42 starts and finished 36 of them. He was 26 and 15 with a 2.18 average. His salary in 1946 was $40,000. He had a contract, however, with the Indians and Bill Veck that provided incentives on attendance and Municipal Stadium in Cleveland at that time held 90,000. Feller made 148,000 in 1946, which is equivalent to 1.8 million. If we use that as the change, Feller to Cole, it's an increase in the factor of about 20. No, nope, there's still a rather substantial increase. Finally, what's happened to the average CEO? Uh, there's a bunch of papers that look at pay, uh, how much they were paid, and I found 1965 data. And I can compare it to 2018, which is roughly the baseball comparisons I'm talking about. And uh, I adjust for inflation. Uh, the mean salary in 2018, now this is not the same compensation measure I'm using. It doesn't include the value of in the money options. It includes reported pay and with options valued at exercise. Average pay is 16.7 million. And in, 2000, in, in 1965, it was about 400,000. So pay for CEOs have gone, has gone up by less. Another measure of the inequality. What about the pay of spawn relative to the average player in 64 and the pay of uh, coal relative to the average player? For spawn, it was a factor of six. He was six times more than the average. Coal, he was uh, uh, nearly nine times more than the average. Put this together and you say, talent is getting paid more. Uh, and uh, talent consists of athletes who are occupying the 1%. I'm gonna talk about that in a minute. Uh, the point here is uh, that CEOs aren't different from others. And I, you know, I could go through this analysis for lawyers I could go through this analysis for NBA star, uh, NBA uh, players, NFL players, tennis players, golfers. You're going to find the same thing. That uh, there's a premium for talent, and that's because, I mean, think about it. The revenues are bigger now. Why are the revenues bigger? Because we can tell you can televise everything. And I was a kid, you got lucky if you watched the game on Saturday. There was an occasional Cleveland Indian game that, was, that I could watch. And now, 
you know, I, I, every night I can, I have the baseball package. I can watch any major league team. Well, that's generated more revenues. More revenues have, have flowed to more pay for baseball players. Um, companies are getting bigger, more revenue. It's showing up with CEO pay. Um, I'm not telling you there's nothing wrong with CEO pay. What I'm telling you is the people who are arguing, uh, I'm challenging the people who are arguing that pay is too high because they usually begin, begin their argument with the assumption that's stated in that Wall Street Journal article I started with, that there's no association between pay and performance. That's not true. There is, and boards consider the market. Now that doesn't say that there might exist a way of paying CEOs that would pay them on average less without adversely affecting return to shareholders. I don't dispute that, but that's a much harder argument to make. Now, because it's a harder argument to make, I'm thinking about how I might look at it uh, because I'm not convinced that you need to pay them as much. When you think about it, when you use options, you don't know how much you're paying so Depends on what happens to the share price, what happens to the market. Is there a way to think about this differently? I don't know that there is, but it's worth consideration. Now, what about income inequality? And our, my friend, Mr. Piketty, Piketty who says that um, CEOs are responsible for the income inequality increase. I'm gonna tell you, no, they aren't. First thing I'm gonna tell you though, is all this business you read in the newspaper about income inequality continually increasing is bunk, lies. It hasn't continually increased. It is true that it is higher than it was in the 70s. But most of that increase occurred from 1980 to 2000. And I have some charts. I have three charts that I'm gonna show you here um, that uh, show the percentage of income for the top 1%. And you'll see a blue line and a red line in each chart. Uh, when I measure the income for the 1% and the income for everybody else, I add in untaxed pensions because some pensions funded with uh, after-tax dollars uh, don't get taxed other than the returns on them. I add in untaxed Social Security, which is a very big number for individuals with incomes under $30,000. And so that's the red line. The blue line is just adjusted gross income. And if you look at the red line, what will you say? Well, gee, Ron, it looks as though income inequality as measured by the fraction of income for the top 1% is lower today, lower in 2018 than it was in 2000. It will run, why don't you show it for 2019 and 2020? Because I use IRS data, returns can be filed late and I won't be able to look at 2019 until later this year. You're about a year and a half behind. But if you look at that chart, it's just wrong to say income inequality is, in, is increasing. It has increased, but not since 2000. It's been relatively flat. It's jumped all around. And you might say, well, did you think about what causes that? Yes, I can explain all that variation just by looking at the average amount declared on Schedule D for the 1% and the number of people declaring gains on Schedule D. If you look at that variation, it accounts for that jumping around, accounts for 95% of that jumping around. Now, there's an implication there. The, Current president wants to raise the capital gains tax to 43%. I'm not gonna say that's a good idea, certainly. But what I'm seeing and what is what I saw in my CEO pay 
um, and, and we're seeing in other professions as well, a significant amount of pay is now equity-based. And it's substituting from other forms of pay that are taxed. I would have no trouble with a law that says all capital gains should be taxed as ordinary income because it's, it, it is part of income now. Finally, you say, well, well, wait a minute, Ron, wait, tell me about Piketty. Why is Piketty wrong? Okay, so 2018, I've got uh, average pay of 16.7 million. And I multiply that by 500 because there are 500 S&P 500 CEOs. And then I calculate the total income for the 1%. Now there are about 153 million returns in 2018 over $11 trillion of income. Uh, I, the 1% uh, are get more than 1% of that income. But I calculate total S&P 500 CEO pay as a fraction of total income for the 1%. It's tiny. It's one third of a percent. Here's what that means. If tomorrow we wiped out the pay for every S&P 500 CEO, the fraction of income for the top 1% would fall from 19.76% to 19.7%. You say, well, that's no big deal. You're right. Now, pickety who I was unkind to earlier, appropriately, could have figured that out. This doesn't require sophisticated analysis. It requires knowledge of arithmetic. There just aren't enough CEOs. What's produced the increase in inequality is not just the increase in CEO pay, it's increase in the pay of baseball players, football players, basketball players, lawyers, some hedge fund managers, all sorts of occupations, we've rewarded their bigger premiums for being very talented. And that has boosted inequality. In addition to which I would argue, as I pointed out to you, since I can explain the variation with equity-based pay, the other thing that's boosted it is this shift to equity-based pay that has produced the association that I found in my regression. Okay, final chart, and then I'll open this up to questions. I haven't been watching my watch, but um, I'm, uh, I'm ready to finish. Uh, I just want to show you one last chart that shows you the 1%, the fraction of income going to the 1%, and the fraction of income going to the 90th to 99th percentile. That's the top blue line. Notice how that increases steadily. And you put those two together, and that says that the fraction below is going down. I agree. That's happening. I don't want to hide that. Uh, but on the other hand, I don't have a simple solution for this. We're paying talent more. Uh, you say, well, should we tax them more? Uh, that's clearly worth consideration. Uh, but uh, the we're paying, the market is working. There's a market for CEO, a market for baseball players, a market for every talented individual, and that's what's producing their pay, and that's what's boosting income inequality. Okay, I see there are three, ch four chats, three Q and A's. Uh, Sean, you wanna tell me who's uh, gonna disagree with me? Yeah, no problem. So I think what we'll do is we'll go through a couple of these questions. We have about 10 minutes to go. So I'll read them out to you. Uh, the first one coming from Mike goes, uh, makes sense that compensation can be linked to shareholder return through options. Question is how much influence does a CEO singularly have on shareholder return? Perhaps could argue Warren Spahn's performance has greater influence on game outcome than a CEO does on company performance. Uh, Spahn pitched 
every fourth day in those days. The CEO goes to work every day. Now, I, I, I think that ultimately the CEO is responsible. The actions that Boo shareholder return are traceable to all of, a large number of individuals in the company, but the CEO is responsible for selecting those individuals, managing those individuals, saying yes to some things, no to others. I, I think the CEO has a significant amount of return or uh, a significant amount of control over uh, uh, shareholder return. All right, and uh, so then moving on, I think a little similar type question came in also. I uh, says, so Ron, how, why do boards pay at the level they do when returns not, uh, are not even at market level? I'm also assuming starting salary like ball players are due to market conditions. Why is a European CEO paid less than a US CEO? And it's probably a similar kind of, my guess is some type of answer, but. Um, well, you know, I taught in Europe in Switzerland and in the Netherlands. I started an executive program in the Netherlands. And, and what you will find in Europe is that the perquisites for a CEO are quite, are, are much more than they are in the US, or at least they were at the time that I looked. And one of the reasons you have that uh, is because uh, you have, you had, and still do to some extent have higher marginal tax rates. So if you, if you are a, a really good CEO and they offer you a job in the US, uh, you ought to go there because the, uh, the, the taxes are lower. Um, I, I, I don't know, I mean, I haven't looked at these international differences a lot uh, or to what extent this is traceable to other things. It's a bit of a puzzle. I'm not gonna tell you I know um, I'm going to tell you that there are a lot of Europeans and people from all over the world who are CEOs of U.S. companies and who start companies in the U.S. Uh, okay, so moving on. The next question would be from PT. Does income inequality really matter? Are there problems that it causes? I don't know. Um, I, I really don't. Uh, you know, I uh, look. You get to be seventy-nine years old, and you look back, and you know, there's all these talks about the standard of living hasn't increased. Listen, let me tell you something. If you give me the choice of living in 1956 or uh, 2021. I'm picking 2021 in the midst of a pandemic. Pandemic uh, that that there has been a significant advancement in, in uh, the standard of living. Uh, well, lives of everyone are better. Uh, do these numbers of, of the CEO pay appear large to me? They do, and I often wonder what do you do when you have that much money. Um, and but a lot of them do give it away. And if any of you of them are out in the audience today thinking about thinking about giving it to the Simon School, we have a new dean. I'm a big supporter of hers and uh, pull out your checkbook. Uh, but there are disparities. I don't know of any impact. What is troubling and we should all be worried about are arbitrary restrictions on entry that keep people out of some occupations. We have occupational licensing laws, uh, discrimination of all sort. That's producing part of the differences. And to the extent we could get rid of that, uh, we're uh, better and we'll be a richer society. Okay, so then moving on, we have two more and we have about five minutes. So we have two in the queue. So I'm gonna go with both those. Uh, my schedule's open. So you, you can go as long All as right. you want. So the next one would be, uh, Ron, you have a great take on the term culture as it applies to avoiding the Junius Morgan problem. Would you mind taking a minute to expand on that? I don't like the word culture. And the reason I don't like the word culture, and I had a, a, a very long argument with Zimmerman and a, uh, an alum on this. 
Um, and the reason I don't like the word culture is that it uh, doesn't direct you uh, to a short list of items to consider uh, when a company is underperforming. Uh, and, I, and I have now pushed this further and say, okay, here's my short list. Here are the four things you should look at uh, when to, to determine whether a company is underperforming. The first, and it's an important one, is does a company have a viable strategy? There are companies without them, and, and depending on whether it has it or not, uh, uh, makes a big difference in terms of the company performance. Second, uh, how, how are decisions made in the company? Does the company exploit organizational knowledge? Uh, and, and if it do, doesn't, uh, you're going to find that there are likely problems in the kinds of decisions that are made. Third, how do you avoid the Junius Morgan problem when you decentralize? And that would be through evaluation and rewards. And fourth, which I've added, and you can say, well, you're, you're, you're creeping into the area of uh, culture, and I would confess maybe I am. I would add, how does communication occur in the company? And communication has two components, what people say and the way they behave. You know, I now have a couple of lectures on what I call diseased organizations. And these are organizations with uh, serious problems and a lot of them are traceable to first, a flawed evaluation system and a, a failed communication process, part of which was attributable to the way the individual or individuals at the top behave. Now, I'll take those four lists. You go running through the organization, looking at culture. You, you calculate the happy to grumpy ratio. That's favorite of the um, of the culture people. And Stump, the Wells Fargo CEO claimed because the happy to grumpy ratio was high, Wells Fargo employees were behaving ethically. These were the Wells Fargo employees who were creating false accounts for clients. I'm going to tell you, look at, I'll tell you something that happened in that company that's more important. Branches were notified 24 hours in advance that inspectors were coming to look at the accounts. And guess what? They didn't find the fraud. The evaluation process, the way decisions are made, the strategy and the communication, and if you never use the word culture, uh, I don't think you'll be any the worse. You use those four, you'll find out what's going wrong. Great answer. And then uh, I think based on time for our last question, it would be, how do you think the proposed federal tax hikes will impact CEO compensation over the next few years? I don't know enough about uh, changes in the tax hike. If it's just a, if, if it's uh, th there, I did, I have not read this paper carefully, but there is a paper that says part of the difference in pay between CEOs today and CEOs 40 years ago has to do with, uh, it would be more than 40 years ago, has to do with difference in the market marginal tax rates. You know, marginal tax rates in the 50s were 90%, and that will have an effect on how CEOs are paid. The re reducing those rates uh, said that most of the money that a company pays the CEO ends up in the CEO's pocket. It has a big difference. I'm not aware of any proposed changes in taxes, and I haven't studied this carefully, uh, other than the 43% on capital gains, I think is too high. Raising the marginal rate to avoid or, or reduce what is a, a, a terrifyingly large deficit uh, if it's a small change, I, I don't know that it have any effect on CEO pay. Well, at this point, we're coming up on the hour. We don't have any more questions in the queue. So I'd like to thank Ron. I'd like to thank my fellow alumni for joining us today. Uh, the Simon Alumni Board looks forward to partnering with you to make Simon ever better. 
and we wish you all the best. Have a great day, everybody. If anybody wants has more questions, send me an email, schmidt at simon.rochester.edu. And I'll be happy to, if you have questions that you didn't get to ask.